Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you back to our nightly meeting. And thank you, H for H. Thank you for that nice quartet. Nice to hear male voice singing and uh, praising God. Well, how are you guys doing tonight? Doing good? You had a good Saturday? Good Sabbath? It was a wonderful day for me to spend time preaching, sharing, and uh, take some time to study more. And I am praying and hope, uh, I am praying and, and asking God to bless us this evening in a very special way. Because we're going to talk about some things that are going to perhaps be a little bit shocking, it may open your eyes. But tonight, I want you to have open heart, open mind, and always in tune to hear the voice of God, that you will see the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What do you say? Amen? Amen. All right, so let's begin our topic tonight, why many church members are going to be lost. Now, that is really a sad topic, but it is reality. So tonight, we're going to begin our study from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, the Bible says this, listen. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now, this Bible text is talking about the second coming of Jesus. What did I say? Second coming of Jesus, and the Bible says, How many eyes shall see him? Every eye shall see him, meaning his coming is really visible. And also other places in the Bible speaks about not only, sound, not only sight, but we are going to hear sound as well. So when Jesus comes, my friends, every eye shall see him and every ear shall hear him coming in the clouds of heaven. It will not be secret for sure. However, the Bible says, it says, he comes with what? Clouds. Now, that is a good indication that this is talking about the second coming of Jesus. Now, let me show you in other places in the Bible. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the what? Clouds. Again, see, the Bible is pretty clear. So when the Bible says he shall come in the clouds, this is talking about the second coming. In Luke chapter 21, verse 26, the Bible says men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the what? Son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It is very interesting and very consistent throughout the Bible. When Jesus comes back, the Bible says he will come with clouds. Now, if we do a deeper Bible study, clouds, okay? Um, maybe you're thinking, you know how pe many people have this cute idea about heaven. Heaven is all about you're sitting on clouds, right? Maybe they got the idea from the way that Jesus is coming back. In fact, the Bible says, clouds are God's chariots. Okay? You, uh, what do you guys drive around here? You guys drive around a Japanese car? Honda? Toyota? What about Korean cars? You're not driving Korean cars? Hyundai? All right. So that's what we drive here. But in heaven, especially for Jesus, his ride, his chariot, are clouds. How, how about that? No pollution at all. Yeah, and there's no need for gas. It's not by electricity. It's clouds. He's going to ride on clouds. However, uh, don't imagine Jesus sitting on clouds and the clouds is taking him away. Now, that's the way the Bible is expressing, okay? That's the way the Bible is expressing. However, listen, in other places in the Bible, the Bible says, God's angels are his chariots. And in the book of Ezekiel, all right, chapter 1 and chapter 10 makes it pretty clear 
the angels of God, the cherubims, are the ones that are carrying the throne of God. So when the Bible says he's coming with the clouds of heaven, that's really talking about his coming with all his holy angels. Yes. So, and that is a clear picture of the coming of Christ right there. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, we go back to the same text. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Now you understand. Second coming. And every sh eye shall see him. And then, let's talk about this. Now, this is very interesting. Because the Bible says, And they also, which what? Pierced him. Not only every eye shall see him, but including every eye. Now, when the Bible says every eye, it is talking about um, all the righteous people and all the wicked people. But the book of Revelation makes additional specific indication that even those that pierced him, they shall see him coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, this is, this is a reason why, now listen, this is a reason why we believe that there is going to be a special resurrection for those that pierced Jesus. They will come up just before the coming of Christ. Or may I say, just at the time when Jesus is coming, there are going to be people who pierced him. Well, now, what does that mean, pierced him? Does that sound positive or negative? Pierced him. What are you thinking? Pierced. Basically, those that what? Crucified him. Killed him. Okay? They get to see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. So for that reason, that we're going to have a special resurrection for those people. Now, but how do we know? Do we have a confirmation from the Bible? Are you telling me that those people who killed Jesus on the cross, they are going to come out of the grave and see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven? Yes. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus said. Now, check this out. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 63, do you remember when Jesus was standing before Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel, the leader of Hebrew people? Now, he he's supposed to represent the Messiah. He's supposed to represent, really, Jesus Christ. But then he was not acting the right way. In fact, the Bible says, And the high priest answered and said unto him, You see, high priests and other religious leaders and the, the Levites and the priests and the Sadducees and Pharisees, they were trying to find fault in Jesus because they were trying to get rid of him. They cannot handle his teaching. They cannot <clears throat> accept what his preaching because, my friends, truth, it hurts. Yes or no? So when they, see, when they see Jesus, just looking at Jesus is painful. Do you, do you have anybody like that in your life? Just seeing that person is painful? I am not talking about your ex-boyfriend, okay? But do you know anybody like that in your life? They, they are so good. They are so upright. They are so holy. They are so Christian, so loving. Just looking at them is painful. Do you know what I'm talking about? You kind of wish because when you're enjoying your sin, you don't want to meet that kind of people. Yes or no? Right? You want to avoid them, get rid of them. Exactly. So here are, now listen, listen. Remember the title? Why many church members are going to be lost? Look, it was the church members. Religious leaders, Jewish leaders, they're the one that put Jesus to death. And they're going to be lost. So just because you're a religious person, just because you're a church member, please don't have false security. So we're going to find out exactly, all right? And the Bible says, look, this Caiaphas, he was getting really frustrated, angry, because Jesus will not give them anything to find fault. So he, uh, he, at the end, he says, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee, meaning I demand you by the authority that was given to me from God. Yeah, 
He was pretty uh, pompous, right? Uh, and he says, I demand you by the authority. I, you tell me, I jure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Tell us, who are you, right? And then Jesus said, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the what? Son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the what? Clouds of heaven. Whoa! He's like, Caiaphas is like, Tell us if you are the Son of God, the Christ. Jesus, didn't, he did not say yes or no. In fact, he went further. You see, um, back in those days, uh, they, at that time, high priest is from religious group called Saint, um, Sadducees. Okay, Sadducees. There are Pharisees and Sadducees. Both are religious groups, but the Pharisees, more legalistic. Sadducees, a little more liberal. And they usually, for some reason, they choose high priests from the Sadducees. And it was like that at that time. Okay? Now, Sadducees, they do not believe in the resurrection and the judgment and angels. You was, they don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe in judgment. They don't believe in angels. So Jesus said to high priest who is from Sadducees, he says, you will see me coming in the what? Hereafter shall you see Son of Man sitting on the what? Right hand of power. When he says right hand of power, that is the idea of judgment. Son of Man is coming to judge. And then it says, and, and then Son of Man is coming. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, I know you're going to kill me, but guess what? I will be resurrected. And then he says, sitting on the right hand of God, right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven, and clouds, they understood, it represents angels. So when, when Caiaphas, now check this out, when Caiaphas, he basically heard, what you're telling me that after I die, I'm going to see you coming in the clouds of heaven with the power of God? He, he was so convicted. He, he was so convicted and so proud. Okay, don't be so proudful now because he was so proud. He was not ready to say, that's the truth. No, rather, what did he do? The Bible says, then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. Crucify him. That's what he said. I mean, can you imagine, have you ever got angry so much, you're, you're, you're so angry that you rip your clothes off? Yeah? And this high priest, in, in order for him to fight against the truth, listen, in order for him to fight against the truth, he has to, like, rip his clothes are you like that sometimes? Are you like that sometimes? Truth, it is so piercing. Truth, it is so truthful and honest. Truth, it is so heavy and strong, and you can feel the conviction so that in order for you to fight against it, you have to go to the other extreme to not listen to the truth. Are you like that sometimes, my friends? But let me tell you something. Many Christians, even though they are members, they are like that secretly in their heart. And like, the, like that Caiaphas, my friends, you might end up, when you reject the truth, basically, my friends, you are rejecting Jesus. So make sure that you know truth to believe. So, that's exactly what Jesus said. You will see me coming in the clouds of heaven. 
So that is exactly what the Bible says. They also which what? Purest him shall see him. And then the Bible says, and all the kindreds of the earth shall what? What's the next word, please? What is that word? Well, what does that mean, well? It just, it means crying and weeping. So the Bible says, at the coming of Christ, many people are going to cry and weep. Why do you think they're crying and weeping? Do you think they're going to cry and weep for joy? No, my friends. They're going to cry. They're going to weep because they know that they are not going to be saved. At that moment, it's too late. Perhaps many of them are thinking they are going to be saved. But when they see Jesus, Jesus face to face, at that moment, they will know they are not saved. Can you imagine? And you may say, well, thank God I am not going to be one of them. I'm sure I'm going to be saved. Now, it is a good thing to have assurance in Jesus. Amen? It is a good thing to have a confidence in Christ. The Bible says we should have confidence. However, your, your assurance, your confidence, your faith should be based upon the clear teaching of the Bible. Because, my friends, there are many people, they may have false confidence, false assurance. They just say, I'm going to be saved. They just say, I'm going to heaven. They just say, I am born again. However, it's not based upon the Bible. It's not true conversion, and it's not true salvation experience. So, it doesn't matter what I say, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't matter what you think, your opinion. It doesn't matter. Everything is really based upon the teaching of the Bible. What is written in the Bible, that is the most important. What do you say, amen? Because you're not here to listen to my opinion. I want to show you, by the grace of God, exactly coming from the Bible. So here we go. So then the question is, why are they going to weep and cry? Now, let's find out from the Bible. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30, again, talking about the second coming of Jesus, it says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth, what? More. Now that is true. Now that is true. Everybody will cry. Even the righteous and the wicked will cry. But then immediately after that, they will know who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. But then we know the wicked, will, wicked are going to cry. They're going to mourn. They're going to weep. Why are they going to weep? And how many tribes? All the tribes are going to cry. Why are they going to cry? Are they going to cry like, Oh, I didn't know about second coming. Nobody told me about second coming. How come I didn't know about the second coming? You think anyone is going to have that kind of excuse? What do you think? You think someone is going to say, Wait a minute, Jesus. I didn't know. Nobody told me. Yeah, what do you think? You think anyone can, anyone can cry out? I'm ignorant. I never got a Bible study. I never heard about this. You think anyone will have that kind of excuse? Let me show you something. From the Bible. No one is going to have that kind of excuse. Why? Because Matthew 24, Matthew 24, all right? In the same chapter, in verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be what? Preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come what does that mean before the end come before the world ends before the final days okay the bible makes a prophecy what prophecy the gospel of the kingdom shall be go shall be preached unto how many nations all nations. What does that mean, my friends? Everybody will know about the coming of Christ. They will know about the plan of salvation. They will hear God's grace 
Everybody will hear. No one will have an excuse. I did not hear. I, didn't, I don't know about this. No. The Bible makes it very clear. Everybody will know. They will have the opportunity to say yes or no to the gospel invitation. Here, in other Bible verse, in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has, what? Appeared to how many men? All men. So, the, so God makes sure that everyone will get a fair chance, and especially in the last days, they are going to hear the gospel, the kingdom of God, uh, kingdom of God preached in the gospel, the everlasting gospel. We call it in, in the book of Revelation, the three angels' message to every nation, kind of tongue, and people. Everyone will hear about this. And the Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 20, 12, it says, teaching us. So, when the Bible says teaching us, what is teaching us? Oh, let's read the text before. Look at it. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. What's teaching us? Based upon the text before, yes? Yeah? And what's the major, uh, what's the main topic in, in verse 11? Grace of God, exactly. So grace of God teaching us. Don't you know that the grace of God wants to teach you? Many people say, if you ask many people, how are you saved? By the grace of God. And you ask them, are you being taught by the grace of God? Maybe they, don't, they never heard about it. But the Bible says, grace of God teaching us that denying what? Ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this when? Present world. So the grace of God, it does what? It will teach you how to live a godly life today. So if you say, I am saved by the grace of God, praise the Lord for that. Are you submitted to God's grace? What are you talking about? Are you submitted to his teaching? What is going to teach me? How to live godly life at this time. So if you're saved by the grace of God, you should have experience living in the power of the grace of God. What do you say? Amen? And then the Bible says, then looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So it makes it pretty simple, my friend. Look at this. Verse 11, grace is given to every man. Verse 12, grace is teaching them to live a godly life. Why? So that they might be ready for the second coming of Christ. Bible is clear. And that's exactly what the Bible is saying. Look, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, same thing as grace of God is manifested to all men, same idea, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. So what is that preaching of the gospel for? Preparing them for the kingdom of God. In what way? Teaching them to live godly life. In what way? Obeying the truth. In what way? Following the word of God. That's exactly what the Bible is trying to say. And that is the reason why if we read verse before, okay, verse 13, see that? Same chapter, just one verse before. It says, but he that shall what? Endure unto the end. The same shall be? saved. All right, then, the, son, then the, the, the answer is pretty clear. Who is going to be ready for the coming of Christ? He that what? Endure unto the end. And what does that mean, endure unto the end? It just simply means, my friends, they are allowing the grace of God to save them, meaning grace of God to transform them meaning grace of God will help them to overcome their weakness so that they become more loving, more kind, more patient, more faithful. They become, they become more spiritual, more devoted. Is that good or bad? 
That's good, right? Yes. So they, be, so they become a transformed Christian. That's what it means, he that shall endure unto the end. They continue to hold on to Jesus to live a life that is glorious and, and shining with the character of Jesus Christ. And the same shall be saved. So what does that mean? At the end, many people are going to weep and cry when they see Jesus coming. You know why? Because they did not endure unto the end. They did not maintain in that the power of God, the grace of God changing them. They just have, I'm a church member, I go to church, but they know their heart is not changed. They know their character is not changed. How do we know? Because they have an amazing, amazing uh, acting life. And somehow coming near to the church, wow, this is a miracle. When they come near to the church, they become a, like a totally different person. But until they, I mean, even just before they come to the church, they can be fighting with their husband, fighting with their wife, screaming at their children, and they're talking about other people, backbiting, bickering, talking negative, nasty, and they're not really honest, right? They're doing, they're having all that, all those kinds of conversation. But when they come to church, happy Sabbath. <laughs> or, or you go Sunday, happy Sunday. Yes or no? Yeah? And they're kind of, somehow, uh, the, the, I, I don't know, maybe the parking lot of the church is magical. When you go into the parking lot of the, the, the church, it, it kind of changes you. And then they're like, oh, and, and they're so humble, they dress well, hi, right? They, they act a little more extra holy. Thank you, pastor, for the sermon with their lips, but in their heart, that was such a boring sermon. And they walk, and when they walk into church, they're like, you know, they see somebody, and they see somebody, look at it. They see somebody that they are not in agreement with. They see somebody that they don't really like. And they do what they, they do a holy, silent killing. Yes or no? But they do it in a very holy way. I pray for them but I never want to invite them to my party. <laughs> Are you like that? Yeah, listen, we, we, you, look, you cannot put the dirt under the rug hoping that it's clean. You have to take away the rug, let the blood of Jesus cleanse your soul. Because we cannot play church with God. You can with other church members. Even you may be able to deceive yourself, but you cannot do that before God. God knows. So God is asking true conversion, following the, the word of God. So, see? So, who are, so what are those people who are going to weep at the coming of Jesus? They, have the mem may, they may have membership. They may say they're a Christian. They may, be a, they may even give money to the church. Some people, they love to give money. Why? Because uh, whatever project they're doing, they're gonna, the church will put their name on it. I don't know. Maybe you, you Filipino church, you don't do that. But some churches that I go, you know, the pews, the pews, there's like a little name tag. Someone so donated this seat. Someone so donated this seat. So it's like there's so many names donated for a per certain section of the seat, the pew. And the building has a name of certain so, so-and-so. The Bible says, Jesus says, if you do a good work, don't show off. But then there are certain church members, please put my name. If you don't, no more donation. <laughs> if, you, if you have that kind of attitude, your name will not be in the kingdom of God. But we have this kind of thing going around. Listen, uh, and those people are going to be lost. 
if they remain in their pride, selfishness, they, Jesus cannot save them. Not because Jesus cannot save them. It's because they are not willing to be saved. They just like their power, selfishness, and pride. They want to hold on to it because it makes them feel good. And they get, they get this higher uh, social status, even among the church members. They like that attention. Let me tell you something. Jesus, he took no reputation. He humbled himself, became a servant. We have to have that kind of mindset of Jesus Christ. And there are so many churches uh, uh, not really representing the true characteristic of Jesus Christ. And that's the problem. Just one verse before, look at this, look at that one verse before, verse 12, the Bible says, and because of what? Iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall what? Death. And you're thinking, when you read that, ooh, iniquity is increasing. Ah, love of many is getting cold. I guess that's how the world is. Ladies and gentlemen, that verse is not really describing the world, even though you can apply to the world. But listen, my friends, Jesus is mentioning this as a sign of end time. You see, the world is already abounding in iniquity. The world is already really cold in love. What Jesus is saying is that you will see that in the church. In the church, iniquity will increase. In the church, love will go grow cold. That's what Jesus is saying. And you're like, how can that be? So you look, look, check it out. So you have, uh, you have one group of people, iniquity and love is waxing cold. And then you have other group of people enduring unto the end. And the gospel is preached to all nations, all the world, getting, uh, trying to get people to get ready for the coming of Jesus. You can see what's going on right there. Now the question is, how is it, my friend, how is it possible that these people in the church, they're increasing iniquity, and then their love is getting cold? Why? What causes that? Now, there may be many factors, but one of them might be the text before. Look at it. And many false what? Prophets shall rise and shall what? Deceive many. So let's read it this way. Many false prophets rises, many false teachers rises, and they deceive many. And the people that are deceived, guess what kind of life they're going to have? Iniquity shall abound, love of many shall wax cold. See that? Because they're deceived, they feel bold to commit iniquity. Because they're deceived, they don't care about love. However, they're a group of people. They don't follow the teachings of false prophet. They don't follow what other people do. They endure unto the end, meaning the opposite. While other people are increasing iniquity, they're enduring with what? Opposite of iniquity. What is it? Obedience. Opposite of sin, obedience. Other people, their love is getting cold. They do the opposite. The love is getting what? Hot. So their love is increasing, obedience is increasing. There are other people, love is decreasing, and iniquity is increasing. We are going to see two type of people in the church until the end of the world. That's what Jesus is saying. So check it out. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Who are going to be the deceivers? False prophets. What are they? Who are they? False teachers. I don't know about here in Philippines, but I know in Korea, it's kind of sh I feel a little shame to tell you this. In Korea, I don't want to mention the name because I want to kind of protect their reputation. I just, want, I just want to talk about what's going on. There's a church, really popular, lots of people, and guess what? Their pastor, he has bodyguards. Anybody uh, mess with them? <laughs> the bodyguard will take care of them. I guess they will punch people in the love of Jesus. I guess that's the way they give their Bible study, right and left. I, I don't know. But uh, I don't think that's uh, really uh, based upon the teachings of Jesus. What do you think? Yeah? Uh, but, but people are doing this in the name of God. People are doing this in the name of Jesus. In fact, 
the deception topic in Matthew chapter 24 is a major, major topic. Let me show you. Actually, the whole chapter began by the question that the disciples were asking. The disciples, the Bible says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy what? Coming and of the end of the world. So basically they're asking the question, Jesus, what are the signs of your, your coming? What are the signs of the end of the world? Now, if people ask you that question, what is going to be your first answer? Signs of the time. Your first answer. Go ahead. Let me hear you. Signs of time. Signs that will tell us we're living at the end of the world. What will be your first answer? Disasters, okay, earthquake. Anyone else? War, okay. Uh, pestilences, okay. Um, persecution, okay. It's, it's very interesting. When I ask this question to people, they usually say, earthquake, famine, pestilences, war. But when you consider all of them, they're all connected to, they, they all have one thing in common. What is it? Physical pain. Yes or no? Yeah, earthquake, destruction, famine, hungry, pestilences, disease, war, death and destruction. Yeah? Persecution. They think the same way. But notice the first answer that Jesus gave. They asked, what are the signs of the coming? What are the signs of the end of the world? The first answer that Jesus said, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man, what? Deceive you. That's the first answer that Jesus said. Don't be deceived. In fact, deception is going to be a major sign in the last days. We are, you think we saw deceptions in the past? Deceptions at the end is going to be incredible. It will increase. He mentioned this. He said, Jesus said, don't be deceived. Let me ask something. Deception, is that physical or something mental and spiritual? It's more spiritual. See, when I ask the question, what are the signs of the end time? You're like, earthquake, famine. I really worry about something that will happen to me physically. But Jesus' concern, don't worry about something that will happen to you physically. Worry about something that is mental and spiritual. In fact, Jesus mentioned the word deceive. How many times? Take this out. Once in verse 4, twice with verse 5, three times with verse 11, and four times with verse 24. So Jesus said, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, four times. Let me ask you something. When, when somebody is keep repeating the same thing over and over again, what is that person trying to say? It's very important, yes or no? And he mentioned four times, yeah? I usually tell my friends, listen, when your mother tells you one time, you better listen. If she tells you twice, it's a warning. If she tells you three times, three times, you better get scared. If she tells you four times, you better run for your life. And the Bible is using the same communicational method of emphasizing what is important. How many times do you think earthquake is mentioned in chapter 24? One. How many times uh, famine is mentioned? Once. How many times pestilences are mentioned? Once. How many times wars are mentioned? Twice. How many times deceptions are mentioned? Deception. Four times. So what is Jesus saying? At the end of times, don't be deceived. Now let me ask something. When you're deceived, what happens to you? Do you know any good example from the Bible about deception? Yeah, the Garden of Eden, right? Eve. So when she got deceived, what happened to her? What happened to her? Very simple. Before she got deceived, when she looked at the tree of knowledge and good and evil, she says, no good. Bad tree. God says, don't eat. Yes or no? 
She had that thought. She had that feeling. Not good. Danger. Stay away. Right? But after chatting with the serpent, just a little conversation with the serpent, just a little talk with the serpent, okay, she completely changed. She said, the tree is good for food. It will make me wise. So when you are deceived, what's the final conclusion? Your mind changes. In what way? Your thoughts and feelings about certain things changes. Your thoughts and feelings, danger, no good, don't eat. When you change, it's good. I want it right now. It will change your mind when you're deceived. So then, you better make sure that your thoughts and feelings is truly based upon the thoughts and feelings of the Bible. Because you cannot trust your own senses just because I think that's right. No, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, there are so many church members going there. Must be right. No. Oh, that pastor has so much money. It must be the right one. I want to be like him. No, no, no. I, look, 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 look. Let me, let, me, let me show you something, okay? Check this out. So deception is mentioned four times, but who are the deceivers? First one, for many shall come in my name, saying I am what? Christ, and shall deceive? Many. So let's give them a name. Let's give a name to these deceivers. What should we call them? What should we call these people that says, I am Christ and many are deceived? False Christ. Okay? And then the next one, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Who are the deceivers? False prophets. Check this out. And verse 24, for they shall rise, false what? Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, why not? look at this. What is going on? False Christ mentioned by itself. False prophets are mentioned by itself. But at the end, they're working together. Huh. They're working together. What's going on? What, is there something going on here? All right, another one. How many are deceived by uh, false Christ? How many? Many. All right. How many are deceived by false prophets? Many. And if it were possible, how many they are trying to deceive when false Christ and false prophets are working together? The very elect. Now, elect in the Bible, is that a big number or small number? Usually it's a what? Small number. So, wait a minute. False Christ, they were able to deceive many by themselves. False prophets, they were able to deceive many by themselves. Then why is it that they, they work together to attack the elect very small group of people? Why? Ah, because false Christ, they deceive many, but not the elect. False prophets, they deceive many, but not the elect. So at the end, Satan is saying, okay, false Christ, false prophet, you guys work together. Because we have to get these elect. Do you want to be part of elect people? In fact, check this out. When false Christ deceive, he just says, I'm a Christ. And people believe. Can you imagine? How dumb can these people get? Yeah? And the false prophets, they just deceive many with false prophecies. But look at this. But when they work together, false Christ and false prophets, they will do what? Signs and wonders. What does that mean? They will perform miracles. Amazing miracles. That sounds like when they work together, they are increasing their deceptive power. Are you with me? So the Bible is, makes it pretty clear that in the last days, there's a lot of effort to deceive the world and especially, look at this, but who are these people? Who are the deceivers at the end? 
You guys ready for this? Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. Who are these people? Are they political people or religious people? Religious people. But what kind of religion? Hindu, Bud Buddhism, what kind of people? What kind of people says, I am Christ? What kind of people? What kind of religious people? Islam or New Age. What kind of people say, I am Christ? Christians. And these Christians are going to what? Shall deceive many, meaning they will deceive other Christians and other worldly people as well. That's how many? Many deceivers and many are deceived. You know what Jesus is saying? In the last days, the most dangerous people are Christians. If you're a Christian, raise your hand. How come you're raising your hand? If you're a Christian, raise your hand. Go ahead, go ahead. You know what Jesus is saying? Christians are the most dangerous. And looking at how many people raise your hand, you dangerous. <laughs> Potentially. I'm flying back tomorrow. I, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. And he says, many Christians were deceived, many other Christians and more. Now, the Bible doesn't use the word majority, but to me, that sounds like majority. A lot of Christians. So keep this in mind. Just because certain Christian group has so many people, now it's good to have so many people. However, when you are trying to determine the truth, do not determine the truth based upon number. Don't say, oh, that church got to be right because they have so many people. Be careful. Be careful what Jesus said. Many Christians were deceived. Many other Christians. Be careful. However, at the same time, I am not saying if the church is really small and tiny, that's the true church. Please don't do this. You know, uh, searching for church and you're like, okay, how many church members do you have? 50, too many. How many church members do you have? Three, you are the right church. <laughs> it's actually the, 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 the pastor is a father and the congregation is his wife and the offering collector is their, child, their children. Or a child, yeah. No, 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 no. We don't determine like that. But one thing is for sure, in the last days, a lot of Christians are going to be lost because of what Jesus is saying right here. But at the end, my friends, how do you determine which church is true? Is based upon the Bible. What do you say? Amen. Amen? So look, so don't be deceived. Why? Because check this out. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, Even him who, who is coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. See that? Satan will perform miracles, amazing, amazing miracles at the end. So don't be so happy about miracles, okay? Just always go back to the Bible. So <clears throat> Be careful. And then the Bible says, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, the Bible says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. And I'm going to tell you from the Bible, what kind of people are being set up to be deceived? You guys ready? Read it. Read it with me. Not my opinion. Coming from the Bible. It says, Because they what? Receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Right there. A lot of people are going to be deceived because they don't receive, they don't embrace the love of the truth. What does that mean? If you ask them, do you know the truth? They might say, yes. Next question. Do you love that truth? If you really love it, it should change your life. <clears throat> people who smoke, yeah? Do they know smoking is bad? You, you can ask them. Is smoking bad for you? They say, yes. You think you should quit? Well, <sighs> and they go, yeah, smoking's bad. <sighs> they know, but they don't want to change. Why? They know the truth. 
but they don't have the love of the truth. And many, sadly speaking, many church members are like that. How do you know they only have the truth, but not the love of the truth? It's the way they act in the home. In the church, best actors and actresses. When you go home, no more acting. Because special children, they know. They know when you're acting. Your husband knows. Your wife knows. Your children know. Your parents, they know. You know why home is so important? Because home is the best place to be honest and to develop true, genuine, pure character. Outside, you can fake. Hi, who smile. Hello, how are you? Very good, but you just fought with your husband. Yeah, in the home, you cannot think. When the truth, when the love of the truth really has the home, it will change who you are, the way you talk to your family members, the way you look at them, how you consider them, how you put them first. It will transform your life in that way. Why is it? They don't receive the love of the truth. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible actually prophesies, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What is itching ears? It, that means, my friends, in the last days, many church members, they just like to listen to certain speakers or certain pastors or certain teachers that will just please them. They love that. They just, so they don't want to hear the whole truth. They just want to hear the truth that will make them feel good. In what way? Oh, God loves you. He wants you to become rich. He wants you to become prosper. He wants you to become successful. Your family, your business, everything will be okay with God's love and grace. People love that. They don't realize, my friends, the Bible says, before the glory, you got to go through the suffering. But many of us, we don't want that suffering. So we dilute the truth. We don't want to talk about the suffering, the surrender, the sacrifice. We just want the heaven, the wealth, the health, the prosperity. If you're like that, you're just like Buddhists. Always praying for oh, health and wealth and all the things to go well. Listen, my friends, things can go bad in this world. Jesus didn't have a good life all the time. But what makes us Christian? It doesn't matter good day or bad day. The love of God will never change in our heart. It is not about calming the storm, but sleep in the boat in the storm. But many of us, my friends, we just want the storm to be storms to go away. All the problems, oh Jesus, get all the problems away from my life. No, my friends. There are a lot of times problems and challenges are good for us. But, they, but, but there are a lot of church members, they just want to hear something that will just make them feel good, please them. And then the Bible says, and they shall turn away their ears from the what? Truth, and shall be turned unto fables. You know what fables is? What are they? Fables. Lies. Lies. Do you ever like wonder sometimes, like looking at certain so-called Christians, how can they believe that? Uh, maybe ignorant, maybe. How can they believe that? Maybe, uh, among lots of reasons, one of them might be, they just don't want to hear the truth. That's what the Bible says. It's a prophecy. And it is happening, my friends. It is happening. It's like a virus that enters into among the Christians today. First John chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, He that says, now check this out. This is how we know. Listen, this is how we know if you have the truth or not. Would you like to know? How do we know that we have the truth or not? Because many people say, oh, we have the truth. Our, truth, our church has the truth. 
Our denomination has a truth. Our group has a truth. I have the truth. Everyone says we have the truth. Well, let's test it based upon the Bible. Yeah? Let's get from the Bible. The Bible says, he said, uh, in 1 John 2, 4, it says, He that says, I know him, I know him, and what? Keepeth not his commandment is a what? Liar and the truth is not in him. You see, my friends, that's how you can detect. That's how you know. Okay? People may say, I know God. I know Jesus. I am bound for heaven. They may say that, but if they keep not his commandments, if they're not following his commandment, guess what? The Bible says they are a liar and the truth is not in them. So how do you test? How do you test if they're keeping God's commandments or not? That's what the Bible says. Look at it. It's right there. And but so whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. You see, the love is connected to keeping his commandments. So people say, I love God, I know him. Do you keep his commandments? So then, what is the truth? What is truth? John chapter 14, verse 6, the Bible says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the what? So when we say truth, who, I mean, yeah, it's the Bible, but uh, who is this talking about? Jesus. So what does that mean? John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, and Jesus said, I am the truth. If you love me, if you love me, the truth, keep my what? Commandments, you see? Even Jesus made it very clear. If you love me or love the truth, you will keep his commandments. That's what Jesus is saying. So then, when we say commandments, what are we talking about? We're basically talking about the Ten Commandments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm about to show you, I'm going to show you something that may offend some of you. If I'm offending you in some ways, I apologize, but my motive is not to offend anyone. And when I mention this, I'm not trying to say all these people are bad and they're not going to go, not, they are not going to go heaven. I am not saying that. I just want to show you what is happening, okay? And many times people are not aware of this. So then, before I present the next point, let me do a just quick uh, recap. In the last days, my friends, when Jesus come, many people are going to weep. Why? They know they are not going to be saved. And among them are going to be many Christians. Okay? So that why is it that many Christians are not going to be saved? Because they don't have the love of the truth. Exactly. That's what the Bible says. And, and so that what is a what is a clear test to know that if you have the love of the truth or not? The Bible says, if you keep his commandments. Exactly. So then what is commandments? Ten commandments. However, there are some churches changing God's commandments. This one is from Catholic Ten Commandments. The first one is the Bible Ten Commandments. But the Catholic Ten Commandments, look at it. You might say, oh, they just uh, made it shorter or, you know, kind of made it simple. Now, listen, first of all, I am not saying all Catholics are going to be lost. I'm not saying that. At the same time, I am not saying all Seventh-day Adventists are going to be saved. There are going to be many Seventh-day Adventists. They are going to be lost. So it's not about Seventh-day Adventists or, or Catholic. We're talking about, my friends, listen, there are good people in all denominations. Amen. There are, there are good and righteous people in all different churches. However, what am I saying is this. I'm saying to you, you better understand what the Bible is teaching. In some ways, you know, even in our church, I'm not just saying uh, just other churches. No, even in our church or your church, if your ch church's teaching is not clearly based upon the Bible, you better stand upon the Bible, not the teachings of men. 
Because Jesus said, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. That's what we have to worry about. And look at, the, look at that. I mean, do you question? Huh. Look how much they took it out. And what about the Protestant Ten Commandments? Protestant. It looks like that. It might be a little better than the Catholic version, but they took so much out. You might say, well, you know, today we're living in a modern generation, modern world. We want everything quick and snappy and simple, easy. Well, you may have a point. But listen, if we are dealing with the Bible, you, you may not want to simplify it that much. Because, listen, don't add or don't take away anything from the Bible. You got to know exactly what the Bible says. Why? Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's what Jesus is saying. And then Jesus gave a parable. A parable about two servants. Parable about what? Two servants. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is, he that, blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. And then, then there is, there is another servant but if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth right there. The Bible makes, Jesus makes it very clear why some Christians are going to be weeping at the coming of Jesus. The Bible says, in the church, God has faithful servants. And the Bible says, I just, don't accuse me. The Bible says, evil servants. Faithful servant, evil servant. Would you like to know who you are? Would you like to know? You, you want to play the game? Truth or dare? <laughs> yeah? But let me put it together. Put it together. I dare you to hear the truth. Amen? Let's find out. Let's find out. Okay. So we go back to the parable. It says, who, is, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them meat and due season? So what is the main characteristic of faithful and wise servant? Faithful servant. Let's just keep it short. What's the main characteristic of a faithful servant? The Bible says... He give meat in due season. No, what is that talking about? Oh, he, he works at the cafeteria. I don't know. If the Bible says he's giving the right food at the right time. So what is this talking about? Symbolically, spiritually, what does meat? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible gives us the idea of the spiritual meaning behind meat. It says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principle of the oracles of God. And now listen, and are become such as have need of what? Milk and not of strong meat. So right there, okay, in the book of Hebrews, Paul is trying to, he's, he's connecting between Milk of the word and the meat of the word. Milk of the word for the baby Christians. Meat of the word is for growing up, uh, grown up Christians, more mature Christians. And then uh, Hebrews 5 verse 13, the Bible says, For everyone that uses milk is what? 
unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now, so the Bible makes it pretty clear. There's connection between meat and the word of God. So when the Bible says, give meat, give them meat in due season, it's just simply saying, faithful servant gives the word. And what is the word? It is the truth. Give the truth at the right season. So how do we know it? In the last days, in the last days, who are the faithful servants of God? They are always giving the truth to the people at the right time. In order for them to give the truth, what does that mean? They believe in the truth. They love the truth. And they want to help other people to know the truth. That's a one good sign. If you say you're a Christian, but you don't really share, you don't really express that much, you may have to you know, check your spiritual heart condition because if you don't really talk about it, maybe you don't like it. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you're not really enthusiastic about it. You're not really excited about the truth. Maybe you just have this traditional religious experience. Why do you go to church? Because my parents... Why don't you want to change? Well, we've always been doing this. Why do you want to go to church? Well, just in case if there's a heaven, I go to heaven. I don't want to miss out. Oh, not a good answer. That's not enough. Your soul, your, 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 your individual, your soul deserves much deeper answer. You, won't go to, you want to go to church because you experience meeting God, accepting the truth, and having this transforming life experience. That is the reason why you want to go to church. But look at this. God's faithful servant, they give the truth at the right time. And John 17, verse 17, the Bible says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is the truth. So when they give the meat, they're giving the word. When they give the word, they're giving the truth. That's faithful servant. But the evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his what? Coming. Look at this, look at this. Evil servant. Who are the evil servant? Evil servant are those that they say in their heart. What does that mean they say in their heart? They don't really express it. They just say it in their heart, meaning they think to themselves secretly, privately. Nobody knows, okay? They secretly have this desire. What desire? I hope Jesus will delay his coming. How many of you are thinking that way? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I know you're like, oh, it's me. Don't, no, 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 it's okay. Keep it to yourself. Yeah? How many of you are thinking that way sometimes? I hope Jesus doesn't come so soon because I want to go to college, get a job, get married. Now, nothing wrong with getting a job, nothing wrong with getting married. You can still get married, no problem. But have you had that desire, that thinking? That, that's what the Bible says, the evil servant says, my Lord delays his coming. And then it says, and shall begin to what? Smite his fellow servants who are these evil servants they smite the other servants who are these other servants the faithful servants so basically jesus saying is a prophecy in the last days evil servants will smite the faithful servant why because my friends as long as the faithful servants are busy giving meat in due season here take the truth here, take the word of God. Here, here's the truth. As long as you're busy doing this, guess what's going to happen? Jesus will come sooner. But the evil servant, when they see that, huh, they, want, they don't want Jesus to come back soon. I want, my, I want Jesus to come later. But when the faithful servants are doing the work that will bring Jesus sooner, number one, they don't want that, bam. Number two, when they see other servants are doing the work, they feel guilty. They feel bad. Let me ask you something. When was the last time 
you actually got a little jealous of somebody else's spiritual quality. When I say jealous, it's not jealous of, oh, I got to really follow that example. No. Your expression, who do you think you are, you holy Joe? What, what you think you're the only one who's going to be saved? You're, 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 how come you're bragging of your spirituality? Have you had that kind of bickering and fighting? Have you had that little temptation? Maybe. But the Bible says, the evil servant, he smite his fellow servants. Now, you may say smite is a physical, right? Smiting. But you can smite other people with your tongue, what you say. You know how you say sometimes, oh, yeah, so-and-so is fanatical, so uh, too much, too extreme. Now, I understand people can be fanatical, people can be extreme, I understand that, but there are times because you don't want to be so holy, because you don't want to commit yourself to Jesus fully, you, you put down other church members with the label, ah, it's fanatical, too extreme, not, not, not required, you kind of put them down evil servants. And then the Bible says, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. They're drinking wine. What does that mean, drinking wine? In the book of uh, Micah, chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, the Bible gives us the symbolic meaning of wine. It says, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of what? Wine and of strong drink. Basically, the Bible is saying wine and strong drink, they represent falsehood and lie. So when the Bible says evil servants drinking with the drunken, they are taking in false teachings. So Jesus is saying in the last days, evil servants are, they don't want Jesus to come back so soon. They are jealous of other servants. They hate other servants. At the same time, they are accepting false teachings. Why? Because they don't want the truth. They don't like it. Why? Truth requires sacrifice. Truth requires surrender. Truth requires you have to give up something. Truth will hurt you. Truth will point out your pride. Truth will cut to your selfish motivations. They don't want that. They want worldly attention. They want that power, that glory, that honor that they can get on earth. Walking around, I am the first elder. I am the first digger. I am this. I am the best singer. I am the best this. I am the best preacher. My church is the biggest. We have the greatest the amount of donation. And we want to walk around like with this kind of pride. Truth hurts. But let me tell you something. If there's no pain, there's no healing. So why many Christians, why many church members are going to be lost? Because, my friends, they don't want to accept the truth. That's the reason why the Bible said, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're, they're going to cry. At the same time, they'll grind their teeth. Why are they going to grind their teeth? It's very simple. Weeping? Oh, they're not, they're not saved. Grinding their teeth? Yeah? Oh, because it's a sign of anger. Why are they angry? Because my friends... They know that the people that they, they hit, they're going to be saved. And they're not saved. They're lost. It's a madness. It's, the, it's a rage, anger, at the same time, weeping. All mixed emotion that you and I, we don't have to face when Jesus comes back. When Jesus comes back, we want to see him with joy. Amen? When Jesus comes back, we want to have a big smile. You know, when I preach sermon like this, when I preach sermon like this, some church members, this, this is how they listen to me. 
they, they go, oh, yeah, last days, evil servants in the church. Oh, yeah, that's really terrible. I wonder who it is. <laughs> yeah, maybe that elder, that, that deacon, maybe. Yeah, I need to pray for that person. Please don't listen to me that way. Just be, let's just humble ourselves, amen? Just say, God, do I have any evil servant DNA in me? Do I have any of that gene in me? Please show me. I open my heart, open my mind to you. Show me. Because I want to experience the true divine love working in my life that will transform me. Amen? So when Jesus comes, initially, we are, we're going to cry, Wow! Jesus is here! But then, immediately, the Bible says, those that are with him, their body will turn into immortal, glorious body. And then we're told from the Bible, only the saved people are going to feel the little lift. They'll be translated to meet Jesus in the air with a big smile. While the wicked and the unsaved ones are weeping and dying on earth. I know the picture is dramatic. However, it is the truth. So tonight, I want to ask you. I know many people here in Philippines are Christians. Praise God for that. Amen. But at the same time, let me ask you, honestly speaking, who are you in your home? Who are you in your private life? Who are you in the secret chambers of your own heart? Who are you? Do you truly love Jesus? Do you truly want to follow His word? Do you want to obey His truth? Do you want to keep His commandments? Who are you? So tonight I want to give you an opportunity to make a personal declaration, a little humble commitment Lord, I might be that evil servant, but tonight, Lord, stay with me. May the love and the truth stay with me. Help me to embrace it, even though it's going to hurt me, but it's okay. Let it hurt me, because with the pain, I am going to receive the healing by the blood of Jesus. Do you want to make that decision tonight? Because, my friends, I need you to make that decision tonight before we continue with our other meetings the coming the, ne the next day and the day after and the following days. Because we're going to learn incredible things from the book of Revelation. And I need, tonight, I need you to make that commitment. Lord, I want to humble myself Humbly, I commit to you. Help me not to give up. If, if it is the truth, so let it be. Let the truth change me, and I don't change the truth. I'm willing. Are you willing? If you are, wherever you are, just humbly stand for the truth. God bless you. Stand for the truth. Stand for the clear truth. Stand for the powerful word of God. Stand for the magnificent, wonderful, amazing truth of God. God bless you. You are in for a great journey into, the, into God's word. And you're going to discover the big picture that God has for all of us. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us tonight. And Lord, we see it clearly from the Bible that the second coming it is going to be a great and joyful event. At the same time, we, we, we saw that many people are going to be, be disappointed because they think they should be saved, but they are not going to be saved. Because, Lord, we saw it from the Bible 
because they did not love, they did not receive the love of the truth. But tonight, we want to receive the love of the truth. We want to be humble, open, and, and, and open our hearts to you, our thoughts and feelings, our decision to you. As long as it is coming from the Bible, as long as it is truth from the Word of God, give us the spirit of humility that we are willing to embrace it, even though it may hurt us personally. But that pain is necessary in order to experience the true healing of God. So tonight, we want to thank you for leading us, guiding us, and most of all, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because he died on the cross, what is happening today is possible for us to embrace and to hear the truth. Thank you. Bring us back again tomorrow night, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.